Good morning, Mount Vernon. I am excited today. And I think sometimes that term gets used a whole lot about being excited. But the truth is, is that I get an opportunity that you don't necessarily always get afforded, is I get to come to church most days every week. And it is fun to be in the house of the Lord. But the great thing about God is that he is omnipresent. And what that means is his presence is not limited to this building and it can be everywhere all at the same time. So he can be with me at the same time he's with you and that is what makes our God so great. And so I want to say from the bottom of my heart, we miss you. As I look out at this congregation, I wish that I saw your faces here, but we want what's best for you and we want what's best for our country so as we try to go through this time just know that you are not forgotten you are loved and you are missed dearly but I also have a couple of announcements I want to go through for you number one on Mondays we put out a team kid video the teachers are doing a great job recording those videos and I had somebody comment on social media the other day that they don't qualify as a kid but they still got something from the message so maybe you're not a team kid per se, but right now we'll grandfather all of you in. So Mondays, if you want to listen to the team kid devotion, check it out. It's usually in the evening when that comes available on all our platforms. Also, I wanted to let you know that earlier this week we sent out a survey. Brother John mentioned it in the devotional, but it's also going to be in the mail. It's on the app and on the website. So we would love to have your feedback so when it comes time, and we're making plans towards when it does come time to be back in this sanctuary, we have some input from you so the leadership can take that into account as they make decisions for when we are going to return. And then finally, let us know if there's something going on in your world that we can help with. Because if we don't know, we don't know how to help. But if you'll tell us what's going on and if there's any way we can help, we'd love to be a part of what's going on. And so let me do this. Let me pray for us. And then I have a quick reminder video when I finish praying. I want you to check this reminder video out. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray for every family of Mount Vernon. But I pray for the families around our country, around our state, around our world. God, I pray that you would bring our families closer to you. Let us not be reliant on a building or the, the pastor to cause us to be deeper in the word. Let us come deeper into the word because we love you. And let us come into that word each and every day, even if we don't get to visit the church. So God, I pray for our pastor as he brings the message. I pray for the musicians as they perform that it would all be to your glory and your honor. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. wait to see what you guys do next week. For Mother's Day?
taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. It says this, For indeed he was crucified because of weakness, yet he lives because of the power of God. For we also are weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed toward you.
Well, good morning. So good to see you. No, I can't see you. <clears throat> sure would like to see you. Hopefully that'll be very, very soon. I'm glad you tuned in this morning. Uh, as we look at the Word together, we've been considering over these last few weeks, uh, at least since Easter, uh, what is it that a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ does now? And he finished the work of the cross on Calvary. Uh, he was buried um, raised, ascended back to the Father. So what is he doing now? Well, over these past couple of weeks, we've talked about a couple of things that he's doing. One is we found that he sits. He sits at the right hand of God the Father in a place of honor, in a place of completion to signify that the work has been done. Of course, he needs to be in the place of honor. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. But Last week, we talked about the fact that not only is he sitting uh, in the place of honor, but he is ruling and reigning over all things in heaven and on earth. You see, he is also very active uh, in what's going on in his universe, and more particularly, what's going on right here on good old planet earth. He rules and he reigns. He's sovereign. He's over all things. There is nothing that takes him by surprise. There is nothing that is more powerful than him. He is a ruling and reigning king. Great comfort in that truth about our risen Lord Jesus Christ. I want to take you just a little step further, though, today, and I want to look at another thing that the Lord Jesus is doing in heaven, and that is he is receiving. He receives something. What is it that he receives? Well, he receives the reverence and the praise of the heavenly host, the angels of heaven, and all the hosts of heaven give glory and praise and honor to this one who sits on the throne, to this one who rules and reigns over all things. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, uh, Revelation chapter 5 is where I want us to look this morning. And these verses of what's going on uh, about the Lord Jesus there in heaven. John, the apostle, gets a glimpse into heaven. And look, this is not the, uh, the heaven tourism books and things that are going on in our world today. This is a literal view that the God gives to the apostle John as he looks into heaven. Wonder what's going on. Let's see. Verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard say, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Isn't that good? What's going on in heaven? What is a risen Lord Jesus Christ doing? He is receiving his due, what he is deserving of from all the angels, from all the created order. Hey, listen, it's a glorious thing around the throne of God where the Lord Jesus is. Heaven contains worship. That's what's going on in heaven. Uh, look there in verse 14, and the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. It is true, so be it. And the elders fell down and worshiped. You know what heaven's about? Heaven's about worshiping the Lamb, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw a glimpse into the heaven around the throne of God as well. We sang about it a little bit earlier. Uh, what he heard was, in an antiphonal way, the seraphim, the angels of heaven saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is a holy God, and he is being acknowledged as who he is uh, in heaven. There is worship in heaven. There is also joy in heaven. Heaven contains worship, 
and heaven contains joy. In Hebrews chapter 12, the words in verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Now watch this phrase right here. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was it? That was a motivation for the Lord Jesus Christ to endure the cross. We say, well, it's all about us. Well, praise God, we get in on that, don't we? It is because of his work on the cross of Calvary that we can be made right with God and our sin can be covered. It can be forgiven. We can be made the children of God. But listen, there was something else that even motivated the Lord Jesus in his work on the earth. Look what it says there in that verse. It was for the joy of that was set before him. You see, one of the things that he anticipated was that that glory that was his before the foundation of the world being restored. And it was the joy of the Father. It was the joy in the heart of the Lord Jesus that he had come to save. And that joy is fully realized in heaven itself. It contains joy. Do you think of heaven as a joyful place? Well, it doesn't matter if you think that way or not. It is. It's worship in heaven, and it is joy in heaven. And I tell you, heaven contains perfection as well. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But but there are a lot of things in heaven. Well, let me say it this way. There are a lot of things that aren't in heaven. And I'm so glad there are. Revelation chapter 21 says there are no more tears or suffering or death. Listen, it's perfect there. Not like this place. It is perfect. Heaven is contains worship and joy and perfection. And as we saw in these verses here, heaven as well contains the saints. The saints are those who are the redeemed of all the earth, of all the nations. Uh, In in chapter 7 of this same book of of Revelation, verse 9, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There it is. You know it's around the throne and will forever be around the throne of God giving praise and experiencing the joy that's there and experiencing the perfection of there. What's going to be around there are the saints. Those who have been redeemed by the work of Jesus Christ. They're going to spend eternity in that place surrounding him. Salvation to our God who sits on the Lamb, on the throne and to the Lamb. What's the big deal about heaven? Well, I tell you what, there's several things. I want to mention a couple of them. The attention of heaven, or at least of the worship in heaven, is Jesus. You see, all of life is about Jesus. He is the creator, the sustainer of all things. He's the savior of, of men. He is the ruling and reigning king. And you think that that focus wouldn't be true in heaven? Well, of course it is. The attention of worship in heaven is Jesus. Why? Well, because he alone is God. In chapter 4 of Revelation, and by the way, this afternoon, read chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. It'll just encourage and bless your heart. But we don't have time to do all that. Chapter 4, verse 8 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, Now watch this, who was and who is and who is to come. You see, that's true of only God. That's not true of you and me. We're created. We're created in his image, yes, but he has always existed. He will always exist. That's why the attention and the focus and the worship of heaven is on Jesus, because he's God. But not only that, he's also the Savior. We read about it here in just uh, a couple of minutes ago, right before right after these words, but in chapter 5 of Revelation, uh, verse 10, uh, verse 9 says, Worthy are you 
to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. The attention of the worship of heaven is on Jesus because he's God, always existed, and also because he's the Savior. He's the one who purchased men with his blood. You see, he's deserving of honor and worship and praise, and that's going to happen. It's happening even now uh, in a place called heaven. Why? Because he is worthy. And those verses that we read there, uh, verse 12 and 13 of chapter 5, are acknowledging that. Now listen, the worship isn't giving that to him. He is already that. And worship is simply acknowledging it. It, it. it is affirming those things, but whether it's worship, whether he is worshiped for who he is or not, he remains God. And by the way, that is true in this world today as well. Though many, no, though most do not acknowledge and worship Jesus as Lord, it does not change who he is one iota. He is the living God. He is worthy of worship because he is God. And he is worthy of worship because he is the Savior. Something else that kind of kind of flows out of here to me is, is not only the attention, or what the focus of heaven and the worship in heaven is, but it's also the attitude of worship in heaven. And what is that? It's wholeheartedness. Wholeheartedness. There's no holding back, if you will, with the angelic host and the saints of God, the redeemed of God, and all of creation. They praise and worship God wholeheartedly. Why? Because anything less would be an affront to a holy and righteous God. You remember Jesus had a conversation with a lady in John chapter 4. I want you to look uh, in verse 23 here. In John chapter 4, and Jesus says this to this lady, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Do you think God would redeem us for us to come offer to him in in the glories of heaven some half-hearted worship not hardly it is wholeheartedness in heaven the worship of God again why because he is worthy and that's why in verse 14 the living four living creatures kept saying amen and then look what happens and the elders fell down and worshiped He is worthy. He's deserving of all these things that are said of him because he is them. He's the personification of them. He is the eternal God, and he is the Savior of men. Well, that's the attitude or or the attention uh, given to Jesus, and it's also reminding us of who that attention is focused on. But what is the action of heaven? Oh, there's a bunch of them, but look at the action of heaven, and it's all about giving. Boy, this, I think this is a really good reminder for us. By the way, what we do here on this earth and what we do when we gather together in this building, and we're going to do that in a few weeks, uh, what we're doing even now gathered in our homes, uh, scattered all over the place, is bringing worship to God. But this is like a foretaste. This is, yeah, Steve, Steve would appreciate this one. This is like a dress rehearsal. You know, we're getting ready. And that's why our worship, when we gather together, is to be focused on Jesus, just like it is in heaven, because that's who it's going to be in heaven. And the, the, the attitude of our worship, oh, we're striving for that, is wholeheartedness toward God and toward the Lord Jesus, because that's the way it's going to be in heaven. But what are we going to be doing in heaven? We're going to be giving. You know, sometimes we, we, just, we just, you know, we have to be reminded of this, because we just get kind of turned around sometime. Sometimes we think worship and gathering for worship is really about me and meeting my needs and, and, and my wants and my likes. Boy, that's not true in heaven. 
Well, I tell you what, maybe it is. But our wants and our desires are going to be changed and it's going to be focused on Jesus. And so we got to discipline ourselves as well that worship is about Him. It's about worshiping Him, it's about acknowledging Him. It's not about me. And so my response in worship is to give. Now, we, we practice it. Even now, we practice it. But we hadn't got it perfect, but we're going to because that's what's going to be around the throne. What are the actions of worship in heaven, of giving? Well, it is acknowledging. It is the fruit and the sacrifice of our lips of praise and adoration that he is due, that he is deserving of. It is thanksgiving. It is the expression of our hearts and our lips in thanksgiving because that's what is due him. Because he is the giver of all good things. Uh, not only salvation, but every breath that we take. Thanksgiving unto God for who he is. You know, isn't it wonderful? And we heard a great example of that just earlier. But singing is such a beautiful uh, way to express praise to God. It, it's be There's beauty in music. By the way, who's the author of that music? Who is the author? Who designed it? Well, listen, that's the Lord himself. What a gift he gave us with music. And listen, what do you think is going to be filling the corridors of heaven? It's going to be the beautiful sound of the saints singing praise and adoration to God because he is due that. Now, here are other ways of giving in heaven and we, we saw it in the chapter here there is a, even physically there is a bowing down before God placing our faces before him and expresses that heart attitude of wholeheartedness you know we're acknowledging we're submitting we are giving adoration to him well the scripture speaks about uh, raising of our hands and, and raising up pure hearts before God. Listen, we do the best we can with that right now, don't we? We're, we're working on it. But you know, in heaven, we literally will be raising sinless hands and pure hearts before God. It's about giving to the Lord himself. You know, uh, I've mentioned to you how wonderful it is and, and, uh, when you look out the office here in the evenings. And many of you bless my heart by posting on uh, Facebook and pictures of sunsets here. I don't know what it is. Walker County, we have some sunsets that are just awesome and wonderful. And I look at those, and my heart is always stirred when I see the, the formation of the clouds and the, and, and, and the colors that are so brilliant. And sometimes the, the rays of the sun are shining through, and I just think about the radiance of the glory of God. And by, those things that we see right now, do you think that heaven is not going to be greater and surpass the glory and the beauty of that? Oh, yes, it is. Foretaste. Just sort of getting a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. And we're giving the singing. I, I mean, I love music. I love to hear it done. Can you imagine what music in heaven is going to be like? Oh, my goodness, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. It's going to be directed toward God. And that's why. Joyful and obedient service flows out of the worship of God. I tell you, when, when our hearts are gripped with who he is, when our hearts are gripped with what he has done for us, how could we offer anything but not only obedience, but joyful obedience, and especially with the knowledge that one of these days we'll be there with him around the throne of God with the saints of God and with the angelic beings giving worship and praise and adoration to our God. Why are we going to do that? It's because he's a perfect Savior. Listen, he couldn't have done it any better than he did it. He is perfection. Well, let's talk about some other things that are going to be perfect in heaven. Here's one. Do you realize that in heaven there will be perfect knowledge? Perfect knowledge. Now listen, here in this world, and especially in this body, 
there is limited knowledge. I don't know everything. I don't even know what it, heaven is going to fully be like. I, my, my knowledge is limited, not only in that area, but in every area. But listen to what the scripture says about when we get there. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. Think about that. We have a lot of questions in our heart and our minds. We wonder about some things, but we don't know because we don't have perfect knowledge. But you know what's in heaven? Perfect knowledge. We will know him as he is. And I tell you what, when we get that glimpse, our worship is just going to flow out of our hearts. Hearts of knowledge. A perfect knowledge in heaven. I like this one. There's going to be perfect bodies in heaven. What kind of body do you think the Lord Jesus Christ has in heaven? Perfection. Perfect body. In this world, we have these weak, mortal bodies. Not for heaven, though. Here's what 1 Corinthians 15, 53 says. For this perishable, that's this body, this mortal body, must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. Why? Well, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, for our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship's not here. It's in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this. Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity. Oh, this is good. Into conformity with the body of His glory. By the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Jesus is in heaven in a perfect body. And it says that he's going to transform these bodies into a body like his. Isn't that amazing? Not surprising though, right? I mean, God made heaven for all eternity. These bodies are made for just a short period of time here on this earth. i tell you something else that's going to be perfect in heaven. That's going to be salvation. Perfect salvation. Revelation 7, 17 says, For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. I'll tell you what. The, the, the removing the tears from our eyes probably has a lot to do with the pain and suffering of death and, and those kind of things. But what about for our labor? Oh, listen, he's going to wipe away every, every tear for the labor that we have done for him because we're going to see him in his fullness. And we will be around his throne there. He will be our shepherd, and he's going to give us life eternal. That's what Paul was getting to in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, when he said, He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, what's happening right now? Having been saved, he is perfecting us. Oh, it's not going to be on this earth. But he's molding us and shaping us in this salvation that he began the moment we came to faith in Christ. He is growing that salvation and working that salvation out in our life and in our actions and our attitudes and the way we deal with people and the way we worship him here. But he's going to perfect it one day. And it's going to be a perfect salvation. Hey, listen, you know what's perfect about it? No more temptation. No more residual sin that we fight in the flesh every day it's going to be removed and listen no more faith no more hope in heaven why do i need faith and hope in heaven realized i'm not looking for it 
experiencing it in its fullness. It's a perfect salvation that's ours in Christ Jesus. Well, here's number four if you're keeping notes. There's going to be perfect pleasure in heaven. Perfect pleasure. Now think about it. This world has fleeting pleasures. And we're, we're like a, well, we're silly. We, we run after pleasure here and there. And, and once we grasp it, we find out that it doesn't have any stay in power. It's fleeting. Hey, that's not going to be true in heaven. Our, and by the way, our, our, our pleasures, what we seek, are going to be quite different too. Listen to what Psalm 16 verse 11 says. This is great. You will make known to me the path of life. Now watch this. This is a great phrase. In your presence is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Where do we find fullness of joy? It's in his presence. Oh, but I left out that next phrase. Do you see it? In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Isn't that good? Perfect pleasure in heaven because we're receiving it from the hand of the one who himself is perfect. You remember when Jesus told that parable about the, the, the different talents that he gave? Uh, he summed up the ones who used them well with these words. Uh, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. All right, and we, we kind of we understand that concept, but it's that last phrase sometimes we skip over. The last phrase says, "Enter into the joy of your master." You talk about perfect pleasure. Perfect pleasure is seen in the joy that the Lord gives to those He redeemed, and those who served Him, and those who loved Him, and those who pursued the way of God in this world. Well, we've kind of come full circle now. Because the fifth thing uh, in, about heaven is there's going to be perfect worship there. We will be able to do it perfectly. No more dress rehearsal. Uh, no, no more practice sessions. No, no more trying to get it to get. Hey, listen, it's going to be perfect. The worship there will be perfect, perfect. Revelation 5.13, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory, and dominion forever and ever. I'm telling you, we're just acknowledging in heaven who he is. And do you see how we can begin that process even now? Our, our songs of praise are acknowledging who he is. Our prayers are directed to the one who is perfect and ruling and reigning and sitting at the right hand of the Father. Oh, and there's going to be perfect worship there. I'm trying to point out to us today, that heaven is not going to be the boring place that many people think it is. I, mean, I don't know where this came from, this idea that we're going to sit around on a cloud with some harp and, and spend all day long. Are you kidding me? Look what's ahead. Look what's there. It's not going to be a sad time or a boring place. Think with me just a minute. What is not going to be in heaven? Well, there will be no pain wholesomeness wholeness is what will be there well i tell you disease and death and hell will not be there but you know what will eternal life life everlasting the demons of hell and the temptation of our flesh won't be there but the angels and the redeemed, the saints of God, will be there. Let me tell you, frustration and emptiness won't be there either. In fact, in heaven, there's going to be complete fulfillment. Fulfillment with our work. Uh, and there's going to be work in heaven. How about that? The scripture says that we will reign with him. You know, I wonder if some of this is why dissatisfaction is so real for us here. Because we're seeking it with this world's things. And what do we know for sure? Only Jesus can satisfy our soul. Man, when we're with him, there's going to be a level of 
satisfaction and fulfillment unlike anything we could find in this world. You know, I wonder uh, in this life why, the, why there just seems to always be a restless longing in us for something else or, or something better. You know, I wonder if God puts that in our hearts just to remind us that fulfillment is there. Fulfillment is there. We're not going to find it in this world, but we will find it in his presence. By the way, I've sort of come to the conclusion now that I'm uh, beyond 40, that aging kind of changes our perspective about why heaven is better. You know, as you get older, I've heard this from people, as you get older and things start slowing down and, and the old body starts wearing out and, and you can't do what you used to do or what you did, you can't do it as well as you used to do. And, and you know, things just start, start, start drying up around you. And so I just wonder if God, that's part of God's design for this whole aging process is just to turn our eyes from this world and from trying to find fulfillment in this world and start focusing our attention on where our citizen truly is. Our citizenship is in heaven because we are sons and daughters. We've been made a kingdom, he said. We are sons and daughters of his forever. There's a great hymn that, that sort of puts into to, to picture the, the desire of the hymn writer and when he glimpses and thinks about heaven. And here's what he's hoping for. Here's what he says. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise all right let me let me just let me let me just wail on us here for just a minute the songwriter is desiring for a thousand tongues he wish he had a thousand tongues to sing about god's praise and about his redeemer and isn't it amazing sometimes we're too lazy to use the one that we have oh we just haven't been captured with who God is. We haven't been captured with the glory and perfection of heaven. When we do, this is our heart cry. Oh, I wish I had a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace, because I am a triumph of His grace. He turns from His tongue to His heart. And He says, oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. Isn't that good? A heart that always rests in thy blood so freely shed for me. There, there's where our heart response is. He did that for me. He died for sinners like me. And one day I will be that heart from sin set free, singing praise and glory to him. And then he reminds us of why. We ought to praise God. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. I love that. You know, the work on the cross canceled the sin dead against us. But he breaks the canceled sin and sets us free to serve and praise and worship him on this earth. And one day to be able to do that in all eternity. You see, the work of salvation is not just to bring us to a point uh, of faith in Christ, but it is to change us and to make us a child of God. And we couldn't do it if he didn't cancel our sin debt and then set us free by making us a new creature. The, the, the rest of that phrase goes, his blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. Why is he deserving of worship in heaven? Why does he receive that? Because of who he is, because of what he's done. And why are there saints of God more than we can even count around that throne singing praise to him? Because they are some of those very ones who his blood made clean. Are you one of those? Are you one of those? Have you experienced the forgiveness of sin through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect work on Calvary's cross? His blood will avail for you. Come to Jesus. Be saved and worship him as he should be worshiped. He concludes with this stanza, my gracious master and my God, 
assist me to proclaim. I come alongside, help me to do this and do it well. And here it is, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Think about it. What are we called to as children of God, as the redeemed of God? We are to spread his name, the honors of his name to all the world. Well, we call that a whole bunch of things, but the, the, the point of it is our evangelism, our proclamation, our testimony, our sharing our faith is not about us. It's about the God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Think about it. What he calls us to do on this earth <laughs> is exactly what we're going to be doing in heaven, right? We're going to be singing and proclaiming the honor of his name. I want you to be there with me. I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin. I want you to know the joy of who Jesus is. And I want your heart to be filled with the promise, with a blessed hope that one of these days, in his appointed time, because by the way, remember, he rules and reigns. Oh, even over life and death. And that day when we step out of this life and we step into eternity, may we be found with a song of praise on our lips. And may we be found giving honor and glory and praise and falling before the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Join me there. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice our hearts sing, you are deserving of all glory and honor and worship because of who you are and because of what you've done. Lord, speak to our hearts, remind us of these truths, remind us of what an awesome Savior you are because it's in the name of the Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next time. Well, I'm so glad that you joined in with us this morning, and I uh, hope you're staying well and things are going well for you. I want to leave you with these words from that little tiny book in the New Testament of Jude. Listen to these words. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.
Thank you.